In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. call to worship is on page 46 if you want to follow along with that it's number seven it comes from psalm 107 verses 1 2 and 9 oh give thanks to the lord for he is good for his loving kindness is everlasting let the redeemed of the lord say so whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary for he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good would you please stand and join with me as we sing our opening hymn this morning Hymn number 497 in the blue hymnal, Merciful Savior, Come and Be My Comfort. Hymn number 497. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, Grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives the power to become the sons of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. Glory be to 
to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson comes from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4, and that can be found on page 17 of your pew Bible. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. It's titled, The Call of Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, and as the Lord had, to as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, Abram was seventy-five years old when he set out from Haran. This ends the first lesson. The second lesson comes from First Timothy 6 verses 6 through 16. And that can be found on page 1850 of your Pew Bible. First Timothy 6 verses 6 through 16. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Pe people who want to get rich fall into, te into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying under Pontius Pilate made the good confession, and I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. This ends the second lesson. Our gospel reading for this morning can be found on page 1524 in your pew Bibles. It's Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 28. Again, that can be found on page 1524, Matthew 16, verses 24 through 28. I'll invite you to stand out of respect for the gospel if you're able. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 24, reading in Jesus' name. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in, the, in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here ends the Gospel reading today. Praise be to thee, O Christ. 
Can you join with me in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed? And that can be found on page 32 in your blue hymnal. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn number 503 in the blue hymnal. Fight the good fight with all thy might. Hymn number 503 in the blue hymnal. You are about to embark upon the great crusade, toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The decision was made. Today was the day. General Eisenhower's Operation Overlord was about to unfurl. It was June 5th, 1944. Thousands of ships left England carrying soldiers with the objective to gain a foothold into Europe to defeat the Nazi regime. And on June 6th, the first troops hit the beaches. With the help of air support, paratroopers, and naval support, the Allied forces successfully established a foothold into Europe. They took the beaches at the expense of the lives of over 4,000 Allied troops, and thousands more wounded or missing. It would prove to be a costly decision. On the other side of the English Channel, Hitler had also made costly decisions 
that hastened the end of the war. He withheld nearby troops to reinforce the beach defenses, convinced that a greater attack was coming from elsewhere. His decisions ultimately ended in his defeat. His was also a costly decision. Looking back, though it was a costly decision, Eisenhower's determination led to victory. Allied forces, forces were on the ground in Europe, and within 11 months, the Nazi war machine would be demolished. These decisions led to the loss of thousands of lives. Looking back, we can be grateful for the result of, this, of these decisions, costly even though they were. Every year, the last Monday in May, we remember the price of Eisenhower's decree and so many others that have been made in war that ended up in soldiers dying. We remember those who never had the opportunity to come back. Though we may never order soldiers into battle, the decisions that we make can also prove to be costly and oftentimes more costly than we realize the moment we make them. Our scripture text this morning reveals one of David's costly decisions and also points ahead to another still greater costly decision yet. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24, we'll be reading verses 10 through 17. And I invite you to stand out of respect for God's word if you are able to. 2 Samuel chapter 24, beginning at verse 10. Again, reading in Jesus' name. Now David's heart troubled him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. When David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and speak to David. Thus the Lord says, I am offering you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of men. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And 70,000 men of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who destroyed the people, it is enough, now relax your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking down the people and said, Behold, it is I who have sinned, and it is I who have done wrong, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Father God, these are your words, and your word is truth. We pray this morning that you would sanctify us in your truth. Lord, that you would give us understanding and insight into your word here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our text begins stating that David's heart troubled him. He had done something that he shouldn't have done, and now his conscience is pricked. And we've all been there before, haven't we? We've all made decisions that only afterward we take a step back and we realize that was a dumb thing to do. But at that point, it's too late. The choice has been made and there's nothing you can do about it. But let's look at David's decision. David's decision seems innocent enough. All he wants to do is to take a census of his fighting men. And what was so bad about that? That seems to be a smart move. If you're a leader of a country, you want to know how many men you have so you can, be, uh, you can be sure that you will be safe. But David wanted to play the numbers game. He wanted to know how many troops he had because then he would know how secure his country was. His security was based on the number of troops at hand available to fight. The Lord doesn't play the numbers game, though. He has made that clear over and over again, from Joshua's defeat at Ai to Gideon's reduction of troops from 32,000 down to 300, to David's mighty men, one of whom had a kill ratio of over 800 to 1. He killed 800 men and lived to talk about it. Numbers have always been a poor indicator of success, and yet we still look for comfort 
in numbers at times, whether it's in polls, whether it's sporting events, whether it's GPAs or even people in pews, we look to numbers to comfort us. But again, the Lord doesn't play the numbers game. Getting back to David, David takes a census of his troops here. And he tells his commander to go and and do this. And Joab, the commander of the army, tries to remind the king not to be consumed by the numbers game. He says, oh king, let these men kill so many more men. Verse 4 tells us that the commanders of the army, too, were against this idea. But David pulls rank and says, I'm the king. Do it. And so they obey the king. And the process begins. It's good to remember that this process began before the internet. It began before the United States Postal Service and even the Pony Express. David wants the census to be taken all throughout Israel and Judah. And the process would take months. The text tells us it took nine months and 20 days to have this done. At any point within those nearly 10 months, David could have stopped the process. But he doesn't. David has plenty of time to change his mind, but he is determined to go through with it. For nearly 10 months, he stubbornly rebels against the Lord. He wants to know the numbers, and then he will find comfort. The report comes back. 1.3 million soldiers. You'd think that'd be enough to comfort the king, but our text tells us otherwise. Instead, our text says that he's troubled. He's not troubled over numbers anymore, but something that these numbers were powerless to help him with. He's troubled over something greater. He's troubled by his sin. He acknowledges his rebellion against the Lord, and he repents, and he says, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. Wiser words have never been said. Oh, that we would all come to the same confession as David. I have sinned. I have acted foolishly. Please, Lord, take away my iniquity. David could have ran back to his numbers again and and counted his troops and tried to find some kind of comfort in all of his army. But there's no amount of soldiers that could solve this problem for David. He sinned against the Lord of hosts, and it turns out for David to be a costly decision. David doesn't have to wait long for his answer from the Lord. The word of the Lord comes to the prophet Gad and is delivered to David in verse 12. He says, thus says the Lord, I'm offering you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Sounds like some good options here, doesn't it? David can either A, bring economic ruin and starvation to his people for years to come, B, have three months of other armies running rampant in his land and doing whatever they please to the people in his country, or C, some other kind of plague devastating the land for three days. Any of you want to make a similar decision here for your own family and friends or your country? None of us wants to make that decision. David's not in an enviable position, but it's a mess that he has gotten himself into, and it proves to be costly. There's wisdom to be found, though, in David's response. What does he say in verse 14? He says, Let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of men. David remembers again who the Lord is and his nature. He is not a man. He is not without mercy. But instead, the Lord is just. And he is good. And even though David may not understand all of the Lord's ways, he knows that the Lord will do what is right, as opposed to whatever army might come and teach them a lesson. His focus changes from placing his comfort in worldly statistics and data to the Lord, whose mercy endures forever. The Lord sent a deadly pestilence upon Israel, and just like that, 70 men were killed. We pause here for a minute. David sinned. 70,000 men died. David lives on. How is that fair? David sinned. 70,000 other men died, and David lives on. What did these men do that, caused, that 
What did these men do that they deserved to die? Why did they have to die in this pestilence? Why didn't David die? We have this idea that these 70,000 are innocent and that they don't deserve to die because after all, it was David who sinned, right? But if we look back at verse 1 in the chapter, we realize that Israel isn't innocent. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, not just David. And we also recognize that they too were sinners and that the wages of sin is death. A better question isn't why did these 70,000 die? The better question would be to ask, why is anyone left? Why is anyone left? We can bring that same question to us today when we look around and we ask the question, why, Lord? Why did this person die? It may not be an immediate judgment for their sin or whatever sin they just committed right before they took their last breath. But the penalty for sin is death. We should ask ourselves, Lord, why am I still here? I am guilty, and I have sinned, and I deserve to die. It's easy for us to jump hastily to conclusions when we ought to take a step back and remind ourselves first and foremost that God is God and we are not. To remind ourselves that God is the one who always acts rightly, that he is good, that he is just, that he is merciful. And when we forget these things, we accuse God of being unfair. We accuse him of being unjust or wicked because he never asked our opinion on the matter. He never asked us how we think things should be. And we place ourselves in God's place. In verse 16, though, we read that the Lord relents. And he tells his angel, as he's about to destroy Jerusalem, it is enough, relax your hand. And there we find the answer to the question that isn't asked, but we're asking, why is anyone left? It's only because of the Lord's mercy. It's only because there God tells his angel of destruction, it is enough, relax your hand. The Lord acts in his mercy. He stops the angel of the Lord by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite, who's also known as Ornan. You read about him also in 1 Chronicles 21. But the place isn't listed here just for a geographical reference. It would soon be the most important location of all Israel, this threshing floor right here, this place where the Lord stops his angel and the angel relents. This is where God's mercy is seen, and this is where for centuries God's mercy was to be found. First Chronicles 21 records the same event and notes in verse 16 that David lifts up his eyes and he sees the angel of the Lord with his sword drawn, hands stretching out over Jerusalem. And God allows David to see what's truly happening, to see what's really going on here. And David and the elders cover themselves with sackcloth and fall on their faces. And here David intercedes on behalf of his people. He says, Behold, it is I who have sinned, and it is I who have done wrong. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. He takes ownership of his sin. He acknowledges his responsibility, and he asks that the consequences be laid upon him and his father's household. And it's interesting to see what happens next here. In 2 Samuel 24, verse 18, the prophet comes back to David and, and tells him to erect an altar to the Lord. And at first glance, it seems to be a sort of penance that David does, a sacrifice that he makes to appease the Lord or to gain God's favor. He's offered it for free, but instead he insists on paying full price for it. And he tells Arana he will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord, which his God, which cost him nothing. So David buys both the threshing floor and the oxen that previously had just been threshing. David pays for it out of his own pocket. He built an altar, and he offers both a burnt offering and a peace offering to the Lord. And the author of 1 Chronicles writes that it's at this point that the Lord commanded his angel to put his sword back in its sheath. The plague ended, and the Lord had answered David. The wrath of God satisfied there for that time in that moment. The house of the Lord would be built around that threshing floor, that very location. That location would become the location for the altar in the temple that his son Solomon would build. And it would be the place where sacrifices to the Lord would be slaughtered and presented. 
a beautiful yet bloody testimony, testament to God's justice and God's mercy. From there in that place where God told his angel to back off from destroying Jerusalem. However, that permanent place would only last for a few centuries. It wouldn't last forever. And the Lord's hand still wasn't finished with David's house either. However, it would be finished in a matter of time. In about a thousand years, the Lord's hand would no longer be against David's house. When one of David's house would come and drink the cup of God's wrath down to its very dregs, leaving nothing left. And though the son of David would himself be sinless, he would step in the place of sinners and intercede for them. To intercede for David and his costly mistake. To intercede for you and all of your costly choices that you make in your lifetime and to intercede for me. Jesus willingly goes to the cross, making known God's righteousness, making known God's justice, his love, and his mercy. And it was on that cross where the Son of God shed his blood and died in our place. It's his blood and his alone that has satisfied God's wrath. It's his blood and his alone that atones for our sins, for every single one of our costly decisions, decisions that we make to rebel against the Lord, our God. Or decisions that we make to simply not believe in him. It's his blood that redeems us. And the offering of Christ's body, the son of David, the son of God that is perfected for all time. Those who are sanctified. It is the offering of Christ's body. And not our own. But only him. And as the author of Hebrews quotes the Lord in the Old Testament, he writes this. He says, I will be merciful to their iniquities and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. All of that is only possible because of the word, because of the work of Christ and the blood of Christ. The cross is the place where the seemingly greatest injustice to ever take place has happened. An innocent man is put to death on behalf of of the rest of sinful humanity. But what do the scriptures say? Was that really injustice that happened there that day? The scriptures say this, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Our punishment was paid by him. He himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. And so as we look at the cross and we see there seems to be injustice, but it is not just injustice, but rather instead pure justice and pure grace and mercy for us. Because there Christ, having taken upon himself our sin, becomes sin in our stead, in our place. So there we see God's justice. There we see God's mercy. Because the wrath of God, the reason why the rest of all of those Israelites are still allowed to live another day is because Christ paid for all their costly decisions there. The reason why you and I don't just drop dead the moment we sin is because Christ paid for it there on the cross. David was indeed guilty of making a costly decision, one to defy God and to take a census of his soldiers. He lived in that defiance for almost 10 months. Then the Spirit of God came to him by God's grace and by God's favor. The Spirit of God comes to him and brings conviction of sin to David. And David is troubled rather than comforted by these numbers. And he bears the consequences and he watched as 70,000 of his men died by a plague from the Lord. And he throws himself at God's mercy. He acknowledges and confesses his sin and he takes ownership for it. He intercedes for his people and he asks that the Father's hand be against him and his household. Again, it's another costly decision, but one that had already been made. One that had already been made before the foundation of the world had even been set. Before the beginning of time and before the first man ever took his first breath. Before the first sin ever entered the world. God already had made the costly decision to redeem sinful man 
through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, his one and only son, so that we would be holy and blameless before him, so that we might be forgiven and enjoy eternity with him. We're reminded of this price again today. We're reminded of this costly decision each time we receive Christ's body and blood in the sacrament of the altar, where he truly comes to us, and where Christ comes to us assuring us once again that God's mercies are great, and God's mercies are for you, reminding us again that God acts rightly, that he is just, but he's also gracious, and that God is good, better than any one of us ever deserves or could imagine. He has made this costly decision for you, that you would be spared from eternal death, and that you would instead be given abundant life with him for all eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning recognizing that we are poor and miserable sinners, recognizing, God, that there are so many times where we have made costly decisions that seem to be insignificant at the time, but, Lord, they lead us into rebellion to you. Lord, they lead us away from you. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us of these things, and when these decisions happen, remind us again of Christ and who he is and what he has done for us. Remind us that our righteousness is found in you. Remind us that our sin has been paid for by Christ in our place in our stead, on our behalf. Father, we thank you for this hope. We thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy, and that you continue to come to us, that you haven't given up on us yet, nor will you. We thank you and we love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, as we take our offering, I'll remind you again, our offering for Sunday school, going to Holmes and Gia in the uh, Livingstone Christian Church, or Chinese Church, the offering is in the back there for that. Today, if we recognize all of those costly decisions that we have made in our own lives, if you are burdened and you feel your weakness, then go joyfully to the sacrament. Let yourself be refreshed and comforted and strengthened. For if you wait until you are rid of your burden in order to come to the sacrament purely and worthily, you will have to stay away from it forever. In such a case, he pronounces the verdict, if you are pure and upright, you have no need of me, and I also have no need of you. Therefore, the only ones who are unworthy are those who do not feel their burdens nor admit to being sinners. At Abiding Word, you don't have to be a member to commune with us, but you do need to be baptized and instructed in the faith so that you might examine yourself as Christ has commanded us to do. Dearly beloved, as we purpose to come to the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we should carefully examine ourselves as St. Paul exhorts us, 
Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort and strengthening of those who humbly confess their sins and who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we do examine ourselves, we shall find nothing in us but sin and death, from which we cannot set ourselves free. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us and has taken on himself our nature, that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God, and for our deliverance suffer death and all that we through our sins deserve. And to the end that we should confidently believe this and be strengthened by our faith, he has instituted the holy sacrament of his supper, in which he feeds us with his body and gives us to drink of his blood. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup, firmly believing the words of Christ, dwells in Christ and Christ in him, and he has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, of his death and how he was delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. And with grateful hearts, we should take up our cross and follow him. And according to his commandment, love one another, even as he has loved us, for we are all one bread and one body, even as we are partakers of this one bread and drink of this one cup. Will you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had eaten, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, A drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The table is set, and Christ invites you to come. and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon us his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all of our sins, strengthen and preserve us in the one true faith, and to everlasting peace be with you. Amen. our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood. 
whereby he has made full satisfaction for all of your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen. Go in peace. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, and whereby he has made full satisfaction for all of your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen. Go in peace. Shed for Willis. Blood of Christ shed for Marilyn. Blood of Christ shed for Sandra. The Lord bless you and keep you. Blood of Christ shed for Marty. Blood of Christ shed for Bob. The Lord bless you and keep you, Lacey. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all of your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen. Go in peace. And let us give thanks and pray. We thank you, almighty and everlasting God, for having refreshed us with these, your gracious gifts. We ask for your infinite mercy to strengthen our Christian faith, support us in the trials of life, and make us fervent in our love for you and to our fellow men. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A closing hymn is hymn number 282, O Living Bread from Heaven. It's hymn number 282, and we'll be singing the tune, uh, The Church is One Foundation. Number 282, and I'll invite you to stand for our closing hymn. Oh,
Okay. 